Good afternoon, everyone. Um, my name is Rick Weisbord. I am the co-director of the Human Development Psychology Program here at the Graduate School of Education and the faculty director of the Making Caring Common Project. It is, um, I am delighted to honor you, to, uh, uh, to welcome you to Education Now, um, a new initiative of the Harvard Graduate School of Education. It is about helping us as educators and as parents respond to these difficult, troubling times. And we hope in these conversations to, to talk candidly, to provide you with rays of light and hope. And we also hope to hear your questions and your comments and your contributions. Um, so um, we really want you to submit your questions um, throughout this, this broadcast. So in the next 15 minutes or so, the next 20 minutes, we will have 10 minutes at the end to respond to your questions. Um, and you can use, you can submit using the Q&A button at the bottom of your Zoom screen. Um, let's launch into this. I am delighted to introduce to you two leaders and fellow ed educators, um, HGSC alum, Sonia Santolisas, an old friend and collaborator who is now the CEO of the Baltimore City Public Schools, and Anu Ebi, who is the principal of Shorewood Hills Elementary School in Madison, Wisconsin. It is wonderful to see you both. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you for having us. Yes, great to be here. So um, these two great folks are going to talk about leadership during this time, and they're both wonderful leaders. And um, I always want to start this discussion with students. And so the first thing that I'm going to ask them is, what do you think the experience of, student is, the student, of students is during this time? Um, where are you finding students are experiencing challenges? Where are there rays of hope or positive things that are going on? Um, Anu, you're, you're on the full screen, so why don't, I, why don't I ask you first? Do you have thoughts about this? Yeah, um, I think definitely these are um, some of the most challenging times. None of us have faced anything like this. Um, and what we're finding is that our approach has been really working for our kids. We have really centered our vision around care and compassion um, in the virtual learning um, process. And um, kids are very engaged. Um, we have also been very flexible. Um, so that has been really helpful for children. Um, we've also taken this approach that we need to be mindful so that we're modeling that for our children. Um, this means, uh, you know, it's kind of like when you're on an airplane, right? Um, they ask you to put your um, oxygen mask on first and then you take care of your kids. So I model that by leading in that way, modeling that for my teachers, and they do the same so that the kids feel the care and compassion and can engage um, in this new way of learning. I mean, this sounds wonderful to me, but when you say care and compassion, this, you know, this, I think this is something we're all sort of struggling with during this time, is how do you express care and compassion virtually? Yeah, it, it, is, it is a... It is a challenge. Yeah. Um, so one of the things that we are relying on is looking at some of the things that have already worked for us in the past, um, like our tiered systems of support, right? Um, so in the virtual platform, um, what is happening with the teachers, the relationships that already existed in the past, we're building on that in the best way we can in this um, virtual space. But then we're also leveraging our support staff, like our school psychologists, our um, social workers, um, who go to the classrooms with the kids. I'm also there with the kids. And um, if there are any, any issues or anything that comes up, we provide a space where the kids can come and um, uh, you know, work with us as well as the teachers um, during an office hour. Um, and we provide that kind of support for the family as well. So we just wrap the services around our community and our families um, so that kids um, feel supported even if new, if they were experiencing new emotions or new anxieties that we have not seen before. I know I just want to ask you one more question, which I should have asked you at the beginning. Could you just tell um, the, the folks that have joined us today a little bit about your school? 
Oh, absolutely. So it is a public school and it is um, located next to the University of Wisconsin-Madison and we serve 4K through fifth grade. Um, we have children who speak 35 different languages. We serve every socioeconomic background. Um, we are a welcoming gender spectrum school as well. So our um, uh, culture and climate work is focused on our intersectional identities. So we have a wonderful climate of um, where everybody does great things together, but we also um, have a culture of high achievement. We are a national blue ribbon school. So we have lots of great things happening and a lot of great community support and we're right at the heart of the community. So um, it's just a wonderful place. Well, it sounds wonderful. Yeah. So, Sonia, let me, let me turn to you and ask you the same question about students and what's going on with students right now? Um, so here in Baltimore City, I think uh, one of the things that was great about listening to Anu is um, she really was exemplifying uh, one of the things that we've tried to emphasize and that young people are telling us matters most to them and it is this idea of connection, mm -hmm. um, of being connected to, of seeing um, that they are kind of worth the effort um, to actually reach out in different ways. Um, we don't have uh, the benefit of kind of one-to-one -one laptops or that kind of technology throughout our district. Uh, certainly some schools do, but not all. And so oftentimes what that looks like is um, teachers reaching out through phone calls. And so our guidance counselors and social workers are reaching out to families via phone. Um, we have one teacher, our former teacher of the year, who um, just as soon as school was out, only the first two days reached out via Instagram because she knew a lot of her high school students were on Instagram. Mm -hmm. And um, a lot of them talk about how they appreciated that. I mean, even I talked to a group of high school student leaders across um, the district and they were very clear that they appreciated very much that outreach and they also wanted us to know, and clearly these were some of our older students, um, that this crisis is, uh, is impacting them in everyday ways, right? So we have honor students who are now needing to take more hours at work because um, a parent um, lost a job. We have young people um, who were already in precarious um, home situations, out of school situations um, that, that we have to work harder to find. And those are the kids that, that keep us up at night. But I think most inspiring has been hearing from young people that they also want to lead and be part of the solutions. And so as we approach challenges like what to do with graduation and other milestones, um, our young people are actually providing some of the most powerful suggestions and recommendations about how we navigate um, this new world, as you pointed out, Rick, of um, establishing connections when we can't actually be physically together. Very helpful. So, you know, you we're hearing a lot in the news about about students, not about Baltimore, just about general, about students who are really sort of disconnected or disengaged. And I'm wondering if you're seeing a lot of that, and if you are, if there are ways to sort of pull, draw students back in, or how you think about that. Yeah, so we actually, <clears throat> the first two weeks, I think like a lot of folks, um, a lot of at least larger school districts and actually smaller school districts, because when I talk to my colleagues across the state of Maryland, we have close to 80,000 students in Baltimore City, but even smaller school districts that might only have five or 6,000 students. Um, we One of the things we had in common was what you just said, Rick, are the, the young people uh, the kids, Rick is very popular. Um, even, <laughs> even when, <laughs> yeah, <sorry. laughs> um, but but one of the things that I think kept us all up at night were the young people that are more difficult to reach. Um, whether mm -hmm. it's one or two students in a school, or whether it's ten to fifteen, um, that piece of it was very important from the beginning. We have established what I call both low tech and high tech touch points across the district. So we have a targeted goal that every young person 
uh, will minimally be reached anywhere from two to three times a week um, by an adult that they know in school. If it's more than that, fantastic. And when those young people, when we can't establish contact, at least that minimal target a week, um, that immediately gets flagged. So we have low tech of everything from logs, right? So there are some young people who we're not going to see them log on. Um, and now at the end of two weeks, we're really kind of scaling some of those trends to help us identify um, who are the young people that we really need to go after in a more concentrated way. And sometimes it's as simple as, you know, a story from one of our alternative school principals who said one of her students called because of some reality TV show that was on and wanted to know whether the principal was watching. And fortunately for her, she was. And they got in a conversation and she said, you know, by the way, we haven't heard from Sonia um, in, in two weeks. Like, do you know what's going on? And that student was able to say, oh yeah, her phone got cut off because, you know, she hasn't been able able to pay the bill because she hasn't been working. Um, do you need her? And the principal was like, yeah, actually we do. And she said, oh, I'll make sure I have her call on my cell phone. And like that, is, you know, so we're doing both low tech mm -hmm. relationship based ways of going after some of those kids, as well as high tech, which is, you know, you haven't logged in uh, for a couple of days. Is everything okay? So we're really needing to use, frankly, a lot of different ways of, of reaching out and then really going after connecting with those young people. Anna, do you have, do you have a thought about this? Are you experiencing some of this? And I want to turn to leadership too. Yeah, so definitely in our district um, and in my school, um, we're experiencing things like a lack of access to Wi-Fi. Um, and even with, um, free uh, Wi-Fi offers, they don't always reach the communities that really need them. Um, so we're definitely experiencing those. And um, I like what Sonia talked about, those um, touch points uh, during the week. Those are the kind of approaches we're taking. What In what ways can families engage at this time? Um, and, there, and our staff has been really creative. Like we have had in the past, some families really wanting to text. That's their approach for communication. And we communicate that way. Some families use different types of social media depending on the language that they speak at home. So we try to connect through um, the social media channels as well. And then sometimes like, um, like what Sonia talked about, one of the families might say, oh, I can connect you to this other family if you have not been able to get in touch with them. So it really brings the community together in that way. I think where the struggle is, is um, our school was one of the pilot schools in our district for one-to-one -one technology. Um, and in general, because of where our school is situated, uh, most of our families have Wi-Fi. And so we have a smaller group of families we are able to connect with in other ways through paper materials and things like that, um, text. But in, when we look at our larger school district, there are um, uh, schools that have many, many families um, that need some of the most basic resources. So like to ask families who are struggling for food on a day-to-day -day basis, um, struggling for those basic needs to engage in an online platform while they're working, uh, trying to you know earn money and still trying to support their child in an online platform is, um, is a very hard thing to ask. So we've been very flexible, like do what you can and we'll support you in other ways. But long term, we do have to think about that, right? Like we are experiencing this now long term. Uh, we are anticipating that there will be a gap in learning that we are going to have to work together as an entire nation to close. Well, thank you for, for, for sharing that. I, mean, is, I know this is not servicing new problems to you, that people deal with food insecurity, et cetera, but people deal with food insecurity all the time. So, you know, in some ways, this is good that it's coming to much more public light, these kind of problems. And hopefully, it's an opportunity for all of us, too. Um, Sonia, let me turn back to you and ask you the, the leadership question. So. Um, you know, when you think about, you know, you're in a very different leadership environment, 
Um, what has been, what are the challenges that you are dealing with as a leader during this time? Are there things that have been real resources to you or very helpful to you in dealing with these, chal these challenges? Yeah, well, I mean, I, I think the challenge is, you know, probably my challenges are probably similar um, to a lot of folks and maybe distinct in some ways. But, but I do think um, it is a continuation of, of this idea that we have not dealt with this, this before. And I have said in other places, and I'll say here, this really is education's Apollo 13 moment. And for everybody who's watching who hasn't seen that movie or read about it, right? It's, there's the scene in the movie where um, the scientists back here on earth come in and dump literally like eight objects on a table and say, we've got to be able to get them back home. And this is what you have. You don't have anything more. You don't have anything. And, and I think the, the piece that is challenging about that is doing that in real time with real lives, um, with heightened levels of urgency. It was, and to your point, Rick, you know, it was always urgent, right? It was always a matter of life and death. We always knew the importance of education, but when you are in a crisis and, you know, you, you're somebody like me who has focused heavily on, you know, curriculum and what does high quality teaching look like? And then literally, you know, as Anu was talking that, you know, you know, we have families who live in food deserts. And so the ability to be able to sequence need, understand uh, what the folks that you're serving need first, but at the same time not yield um, the fact that schools are still the one public institution that are singularly charged. There are others who do it as ancillary function, but singularly charged with educating subsequent generations of citizens. And so this idea of remaining connected aware of need and still having this Apollo 13 type, these are the resources you have, how do you think differently, um, is, is an ongoing daily thing. Like it's not like, great, let's do this simulation in this seminar for an hour and then we go back to life as we know it. I feel like we've been living an ongoing simulation for like the last seven or eight weeks. Um, and so that piece uh, of this is is weighing. And then the second piece I would say is is leading with the individual in mind. And that has been um, our best capital yet. Like people will do hard work for you when you show that you care for them as people. They're much willing in a crisis to actually come up to the plate. And, and I will say, you know, crisis brings out where your weak spots always were and it shines a light uh, in where your strengths were. And that, that is true. That is absolutely true. So let me just ask you one more question as, as, a, um, as an Ed School alum, but just also as a superintendent. You know, we've been thinking at the Ed School, a lot of folks are thinking about how can we be helpful to superintendents during this time? How can we be helpful to leaders during this time? Yeah. You have thoughts about that? Yeah, I do actually. And probably would have changed uh, now then I probably wouldn't have had an answer for you three weeks ago when people were asking me this. And I was like, I don't know, I'm just trying to get kids fed. Um, right now, <clears throat> where we are is, is actually garnering support around the what's next planning. Um, that piece of having groups of folks who know how to think strategically, know how to organize um, conversations in the most concise ways. I mean, some of the things that I think Hugsy uh, actually does really well. Um, and so we actually had started reaching out to partners um, to, to help us in thinking through the various aspects of what coming back looks like. So there are school health folks I'm talking to and epidemiologists I'm talking to about, okay, if Denmark's doing it and it looks like this, what's that iteration look like over here? So I think at a very basic level now, um, places like Hugsy are well suited for the kind of scenario planning. Uh, my team, and I think I have a really strong cabinet. Now, you know, my team said to me, one of my cabinet members said to me, you know, Sonia, normally we know we can't come to you without a minimum of three scenarios. We are now living in a world where it's no less than 12, right? Because just because of the operational pieces, the shifting, 
um, for, for everything. Um, and so the ability to do that is, a, is, is a, I would say, a great need right now. Thank you. Anu, you have thoughts about leadership during this time and challenges for you and also things that have been key to you to keep you replenished and resources for you? I think you're on mute. Thank you. There you go. Um, as I was sharing before, leadership this time is to really be alive in virtual learning and showing that care, compassion, um, really thinking about your work around um, the trauma-informed uh, learning that we've been doing in the classroom, really bringing that to the virtual learning space. Um, the other piece is really listening, never stop listening and, uh, and um, really try to understand what's happening there. Um, we've been getting a lot of feedback. I've been asking feedback from families and um, staff and also from our students. And uh, the things that they have, and I've kind of drawn the themes out, the things that staff is saying is, um, they really like that we have taken this team approach once again, building on strengths we already had in the building, taking this team approach to lesson planning and really using um, the district's uh, expertise and compacting um, what those power standards are, what are we gonna teach the rest of the year? Um, and that was really helpful for teachers. Um, they, everybody, um, families, the staff and teachers are saying that the priority we're giving to mental health during this time and, and really like putting our energy and resources into that is just right on. So um, they're saying continue to do that, so which we will do. And, um, and you know, it's interesting when you're leading through things and you're feeling emotions, you, you don't know quite how it's impacting others, but I'm getting a lot of feedback that they, that people are very impressed with my calm. <laughs> so I must be <laughs> faking it at least. No, um, no, but they're they're really appreciative of my calm, and I really do um, take the time to meditate, to be mindful, and really be aware of my emotions during every single. Um, um, the event that's happening within this crisis. Yeah. So that's that's what that leadership has looked like for me. Great. Well, <laughs> thank you. And, um, I would love to talk to you more about all this. Um, I have a million questions, but we it's 3.22, and I would also wanted to take some questions from um, our audience, the folks have, who have joined. Um, first question, what can community organizations do to support children's education during this time. How have you tapped community organizations? Any successes? Have you learned lessons on what to ask for? Sonia, you wanna start with this one? Sure, I'll just start briefly by saying our community organizations have been invaluable in Baltimore mm -hmm. City. They have helped to support uh, some of those, uh, the basic needs of families. Um, you know, so a lot of the feeding we talk to I talked about earlier, um, Pampers for families with young children, like they, they really have been amazing with that. We also have mobilized, and this we did not need to start. Um, this was based on community activists who saw the digital divide um, and had the chance to go from theory to practice and are now getting um, you know, mobilized around getting more of our families access um, to technology. And, mm -hmm. and I think just being able to lend out the number of volunteers we've had, helping to pass out packets, um, helping to <clears throat> you know, give us feedback. Uh, we had you know, a graphic design company help us with some quick turnaround um, on things. So I, I would just say that um, our community, the community in Baltimore City has been immediate and on the ground um, in their support and partnership. Terrific to hear. Anu. Yeah, so um, we have partnered at the district level and also at uh, my school level. And at the district level, one of the things we needed to do right away is our schools closed so abruptly. So we partnered with uh, United Parcel Service to make sure that our uh, um, Chromebooks uh, or get to every student um, and you know uh, they gave us a nice deal on that uh, we have partnered with um, 
Urban League of Greater Madison and some other organizations like United Way to really address the food insecurities um, in our community and uh, along with the work that dist the district is also doing to hand out lunch and breakfast to um, our families. Lots of volunteers in uh, at the school level, the community is really doing things to raise funds, um, to purchase grocery cards for families, um, to send books home to kids who um, may not have access to books. So that's something we're doing more locally. Um, and also supporting teachers um, because some of our teachers and staff don't have Wi-Fi access, don't have um, you know, some of those things that we think our teachers and staff may have. So our community has rallied together uh, in that regard as well. Thank you both. Um, another, another question, this was a question I was gonna ask anyway. Students with special needs, mm -hmm. it's a huge challenge for schools and families. Um, how, are you, how are you doing in serving these children and what can we do better under these circumstances, these constraints? Mm -hmm. So um, it, one of the things, I mean, this is, there's a district level decision and a state level decision around this as well as what can we do to provide the services that are in the IEP. We cannot do all of them. So what we have done um, at the local level is um, we've met as a team, our uh, special education team, our um, uh, support team, and really like taken apart the IEPs of children and really thinking about how, what can be done virtually, what are those big um, powerful things we can do in a virtual learning environment. And for kids who don't have access to the virtual, um, to, to Wi-Fi, what, how, uh, in what ways can we provide services? So it's been a combination of sending home their personal devices, such as um, you know iPads for communication for our children who are nonverbal, and then doing online training with the families uh, as needed to be able to provide that at home whenever possible. Um, and uh, delivering um, paper products, um, you know, or, or paper materials home um, resources such as markers, things like that um, are being sent home. And, um, the, and the classroom teacher, we have a very strong core, so that's helpful. So the classroom teacher is always collaborating with the special educator. So they're together in those virtual spaces, also supporting students. So um, all of that is happening in that tiered system of supports. Thank you. Yeah. Tanya? Just trying to make sure my talking didn't get in the way. Um, so similarly, uh, from a district level, I think uh, what was great in hearing um, Anu's description at the school level is our challenge has been about how do we scale some of those customized practices that inform the IEP um, to a virtual setting. And in some cases, it's a distance setting without the advantage of virtual support. Um, so from a district standpoint, um, we, have, we really tried to be proactive with our education advocates. Like we weren't sitting around waiting for direction from the federal government um, that ended up being a little bit murky um, at best around this. So we actually began very similarly to what Anu described, um, setting out um, a, a pathway, um, understanding we were not gonna be able to provide all services to young people. And so there will need to be some compensatory services uh, for a number of students that will have to take place um, in, in more of a brick and mortar setting. But for other students, um, we realized by talking through the IEP with families, having be it phone meetings, virtual meetings, teachers, special educators going through, looking at the IEP, pulling out what we did believe we could support um, and coming to some agreement with that so parents and families would sign off, um, it then kind of lessened the threshold that from a district level often comes when you talk about special ed and FAPE and IEP. We approached it, frankly, very forthrightly and we said, let's all acknowledge where we are, it's not the perfect setting, frankly, for any student, um, even more so for our students with disabilities. 
and really isolated what could be done so that then families wouldn't feel like they had to be on the defensive when we return to school. There, there's some kind of mutual understanding of what those services are that we actually could um, could support. And, and that actually has put us ahead um, in a number of ways. And I'm glad that we were proactive and, and that would be kind of my encouragement frankly, from a leadership posture in a crisis, this is the time to be proactive and not wait. Like we say it tongue in cheek, but we have benefited most when we have just moved with what we know is best for families and kids and then worked around the permission and the bureaucracy later. I mean, I hate to say it that way, um, but you know, given we're at Hugsy, I think I'm safe in saying that. Like we didn't, we didn't wait for some edict to come down on high. We just started with what's best for kids and then we'll back it into whatever the guidance ends up being later on. And that has worked well for us in a crisis because the reality is nobody else has done this before either. Um, and people actually welcome when you're proactive in a student-centered way. You know, we have, um, I'm very sorry to say we've run out of time, and um, I did want to ask you about two or three takeaways um, that you want to leave folks with. Um, and Anu, I know you had written some things down, Sonia, I, I think we didn't give you enough time to, to, to do that. So. Um, but um, I would love to hear takeaways that you have. And, and maybe if it's possible just to weave this in, you know, I think people are also thinking, are there things positive that could emerge from this time as well? And, you know, if you have quick thoughts about that as well. Um, do, you want, do you want me to share? Yeah, is that okay? Great. All right. Um, so one of the things that I think about is when we became a one-to-one uh, -one school, people were very concerned that teachers were gonna be replaced by technology. And now more than ever, we know, we know that that human connection, being face-to-face -face is so important. So that's going to really emerge from this, along with additional, you know, my teachers are becoming more and more comfortable using multiple platforms in a very meaningful way when it comes to technology. So we will see that. And above all, what I'm hopeful for is that because this crisis has really highlighted an inequities. I'm hoping that we as a community will start to become um, very, very aware and tear down those inequities that exist in our community. That's what I'm really, really hopeful will happen because of this. That's what I meant by the opportunity earlier. And I'm delighted to hear you say it too. We should really, really be focused on it. Sonia? You have thoughts, final thoughts, takeaways you want to share? Yeah, my, I, I think some of my final thoughts, Rick, are um, it is just reinforced to me the importance of connection and communication. Um, you cannot over communicate in a crisis. Mm -hmm. uh, that, that has been our bread and butter. And mm -hmm. I, I would just say it seems pro forma, but it's not. And people need to hear and see uh, from the leader. I tend to be very New England in my kind of meat and potatoes, like it shouldn't take all that approach. It actually does take all of that in a crisis. Mm -hmm. People want to know that you see them, um, that that you're straight with them. Um, and I tend to have a fairly straightforward style anyway, but they want to know what you know and don't know. And it has shielded us from a lot of confusion that I think in other seg sectors and areas um, have, have been challenges because we've been straight from the beginning. And then I do think it's an opportunity to learn, but I would say don't take on too much. This is not the time to try to reform the entire educational system in whatever country you are in. This is the time to focus on meeting the needs of people um, and students in new ways, yes, but I would rather do less deeply and simply than try to restructure all of schooling um, in the middle of COVID. So that's what I would say on that. Super helpful. I want to just um, thank you both. I want to, you know, I'm just find it very heartening that the two of you, I'm very happy the two of you are in leadership positions right now. And I really appreciate your wisdom and your compassion. Um, and I want to do our tradition, our education, not tradition, and try and give you a high five somehow <laughs> virtually. And to give all of you a high five out there and a shout out to all of you, all the educators and parents out there who I know are stretching themselves in all kinds of ways. Um, 
And I wanted to thank everyone for joining the conversation and to encourage you to keep taking your questions on Facebook. Stay in touch and check out hgse.me slash backslash ednow to rewatch this and find out about future episodes. Take care and stay well, everyone. Thanks, Rick. Thanks.